Now as we move toward the first section of our afternoon's forum, we are really honored to have a panel. Dr. Sibel Raver will kick off our afternoon with a discussion of her work on self-regulation. Dr. Raver is recently appointed as assistant provost at North New York University. Her work throughout the years, though, has been research on children's self-regulation, which she'll share definitions for those of, those, those of us who don't think about self-regulation, but again, really looking at the importance of social-emotional development for young children's academic achievement and their intellectual development. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's always an honor and a pleasure to um, be invited to give a talk, but it's a special honor to be able to give a talk in Chicago. Um, as you'll see, Chicago is a very, very special place in my heart and in my work. Um, my family and I lived here for six years before moving back to New York City, um, but in that time, um, we were heavy duty Southsiders um, and very connected to um, the needs and in, uh, interests of um, young children in Chicago, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, I also am a native New Yorker and talk really fast. Um, and the thing that slows me down is you. So please interrupt me so that I pace myself according to the interests of my audience, but also so that you actually have a chance to have a, a discussion with me rather than me just talking at you for an hour. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to try to cover three things today. Specifically, why is pre-K to third important? Um, really trying to set the stage for national economic perspectives on um, young children's uh, well-being and really placing it in a national economic perspective. I'll talk a little bit about poverty. Um, then how is pre-K quality defined? I think it was great to have Dr. Cheatham set up that um, this distinction between curriculum and instructional quality. And I'll be really speaking today about instructional quality, what happens in terms of classroom management of, of um, or how teachers manage the classroom. Um, and really trying to talk about the intersections between socio-emotional and academic um, domains of, of learning with a brief tour of a research project that some of you may be familiar with called the Chicago School Readiness Project. Um, and then really trying to talk about what the implications of that are for the transition to third grade as we've, been had, we've had the amazing um, good fortune to follow the children in this study for six years, so from 2004 until today. Uh, with an amazing opportunity to see how they have fared as they have entered into the kindergarten and into the third grade world, and now we're um, visiting them in fifth grade. Okay, so briefly, what is this a figure of? This is a figure of child and family poverty in the United States, and you can see that it's actually only till 2009, and that the figure for children, um, specifically the, the pink dot, this actually lower than it should be because it actually the rates of poverty among children have gone up. So um, everyone can see that the rates have been at about a quarter of our nation's population uh, or a quarter of the children under six or under 18 have been poor and that's been bouncing around. It's actually higher for children under six. This is actually for children under 18 and you can see that it's, it's pretty much remained relatively stable until about there, right? And you can see instead that the rate for poverty Can anybody say why that's been the case? Why have rates of poverty stayed roughly the same for children and yet they've seemed to decri decline so precipitously for the elderly? It's it actually through lobbying from the American Association of Retired Persons, AARP, right? which made a huge, huge effort to transfer larger portions of payments to el the elderly, particularly the elderly women, um, through widows' pensions, which then became social security and insurance, right? So I point that out because um, widows' pensions and Head Start, or support to women with young children, so for the elderly and for young children, actually happened at the same historical moment in 1935 under the Social Security Act. And it's really important to understand that the way that we support young children in this country and the way that we support the elderly in this country um, could be the same or could be different, but that's a function of social policy. And the reason that I point that out particularly is because when I talk about children in poverty, the tendency is to think of poverty, I think, as a natural state. And instead, I really want us to think about the way in which children experience poverty or socioeconomic inequality as actually something that we do something about. 
And when I talk about kids, I act a lot and talk a lot about what we need to do with kids. But I also want to think about what we could do with income in America as a backdrop. Okay, so with that as an important um, preface or an important qualifier, I'm now going to shift the lens to what we can do as educators and what we can do as parents or with families with children. Um, but I think it's important to just frame it very carefully so that we don't treat poverty as a sort of standard static state. Okay, why is poverty important? Because we know that it's associated with quite considerable major educational gaps for young children. So poverty is associated with lower academic achievement, higher grade retention, and higher risk of dropping out. And all of you who live in Chicago and work in uh, the Chicago's public school system or in any other large urban area know this quite, quite well by uh, daily experience in, in working with kids facing significant um, economic stressors. Um, for example, in, 80, in, in Chicago, 86.5% per, uh, of kids in schools are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. And as um, Dr. Cheatham just pointed out, um, the way in which that gap widens um, early on in childhood is quite conserving, concerning, quite grave. More than 25% of children's Chicago's uh, 24,000 third graders are not able to pass their school district's proficiency exams, placing them in quite serious jeopardy for longer term outcomes. Um, one of the key things, however, is that kids are not only facing higher academic risk, but also higher behavioral risk, specifically that low-income kids, on average, face a higher risk of chronic and uh, quite severe um, behavioral difficulty um, compared to their um, more affluent peers. And that gap shows up at early, uh, early at school entry with reading scores for kindergartners, for example, from the lowest SES group, 60% lower than those for the kids at the highest end. So one of the things that um, has often been um, pointed out to me is that, uh, or one thing that I can concerned about is that I've just told you a very s grim story of the glass half empty, the serious um, obstacles that low income children might face. And much of my work is actually on social competence and positive resilient outcomes among low income kids. But I think when we're talking specifically about policy solutions, it's really important to focus very clearly on this gap so that we can really understand what it is we're trying to remedy. So is the solution to ask teachers to teach more? Is it that teachers just need to amp up the amount of teaching that they do? And certainly, that's one thing that's placed on the table. But one thing that became very clear to me in the early 2000s was that teachers were already facing very high demands to teach more and were having difficulty implementing that in the context of classrooms that were very difficult to manage because children were bringing large numbers of psychosocial strains or difficulties into the classroom and classrooms were tough to manage. And correspondingly, teachers were not receiving a great deal of, of training or support in classroom management and how to basically help children on the socio-emotional side. So specifically, um, evidence from my field suggested that cumulative poverty-related stressors like instability, family, or community violence led to children having higher rates of withdrawal and disruptive behavior, and that in under-resourced classrooms in low-income communities, kids might and teachers might be particularly ill-equipped to cope with these emotional and behavioral difficulties of children facing highest levels of risk. So as an example, for example, uh, one, one colleague, um, Janice Coopersmith, said that 16% of children in Head Start classrooms exhibited disruptive and unsafe behaviors like kicking um, at least once a day. So if you think about a kid with behavioral difficulty in a classroom, a teacher can probably handle one child in a classroom and possibly even two. But when it reaches two to three children in a classroom who are exhibiting chronic behavioral difficulty um, during the day, that can be extremely difficult on the teacher and on the peers as well as on that child, him or herself, because the classroom can become so emotionally dis disorganized, essentially, as the teacher gets increasingly upset and as the kids themselves get a little bit detached or upset. So we argued in a number of papers that children's disruptive behavior may limit not only their own, but other children's opportunities for learning. So we saw this specifically through the lens of self-regulation. And when I use the phrase self-regulation, what do I mean? Now, I was very lucky to be able to have the um, access to YouTube. In the early 2000s, that wasn't so much of an option. But you can now go on and find ample video clips of kids losing it and not having good self-regulation, if you like. And they're very helpful. And I actually have the very nice um, opportunity to have brought my own child to this talk, my own 12-year-old. And she helped me find these clips. So I want to give her <laughs> academic credit where credit is due. 
So we think of it specifically in terms of emotion, in terms of a research tradition of reactivity and regulation. Some children are just more prone to being distressed than others. You may have had um, siblings or nephews and nieces or your own children where one child is particularly placable and doesn't seem to get upset very easily and another child is a little, a little weather system, as my mother used to call my sister, um, where storms of emotion come riding through and that child is very, very emotionally responsive, right? And that we think of that child as a highly reactive Active, emotionally reactive child who has to develop more regulatory skill in order to get those emotions under control. We can also think about children having executive function and we think a lot in my field of this idea of executive function which is this idea of regulating one's impulses by controlling or inhibiting one's impulses. Having a good working memory so remembering what it is that the teacher just asked you to do and being able to actually focus your attention on where the, the teacher just directed your, your attention. So it's attention, memory, and this thing called inhibitory control. A good example is if a teacher says, I need everybody to get on their shoes, line up, and make sure that your coats are zipped, right? Now, a three-year-old's mind is just completely flooded by that amount of information. They have to remember all the things the teacher just said. They have to focus on what the teacher just said and look at the teacher and then look at their cubbies and then look at their peers and not get distracted by the toys on the floor or the fact that their friend just knocked over their milk. And they have to suppress the, the, the prepotent response, quote unquote, to go play with the toy or talk to their friend or pick up the milk and instead go get their shoes, get in line and zip up their coat. Right? Now, I can barely, at 48, remember, get their shoes, get in line, and zip up their coat. A three-year-old has about what I'm working with. They're really struggling with their memory skills. And that package of skills is called executive function. In preschool, kids are expected to modulate their distress a lot, and they're supposed to do that in the context of new rules and new routines. So that's a lot to expect, both on, both on the emotional system and on the cognitive system. Where is that located? That's actually located right in the front of your brain. So if you put your hand on your forehead, I don't know if anybody wants to do that, but that's where your prefrontal cortex is. And it's a really, really amazing part of the brain. One thing that we know about the prefrontal cortex is that it's late developing. So whereas other portions of your brain actually develop earlier in infancy, the prefrontal cortex is undergoing rapid transformation in preschool. And it undergoes rapid transformation again, believe it or not, guess when? adolescence. So risk-taking behavior and having a really hard time when your parent is telling you to do your homework, to remember to clean up your room and to get to bed early and to stop playing Minecraft, all of those things, really hard for adolescents because of the same issues that are, under, are happening in terms of brain development. So the next question that you would want to ask me as a developmental scientist is, is self-regulation malleable? If I'm going to target children's self-regulation, I better be pretty sure as a scientist that that's actually a plastic or a malleable portion of functioning, right? There are some kinds of functioning in, in the brain that are pretty stable, like temperament, actually. And there are other portions of the brain or, or of brain function that are actually very plastic, very malleable. And we really want to make sure that if we're going to target something for intervention, that it's going to show change over time and some responsiveness to the environment. And the second question you're going to want to ask from me is whether it actually matters for academic achievement. It's great if I can show that I can change self-regulation, but if I can't show you at the end of the day that that helps children's learning, that this connection between behavioral regulation in the classroom and classroom management is going to pay off in terms of learning, I'm probably not going to get Dr. Cheatham to pay much attention, honestly. Because really, our goal in a lot of ways is to really support academic achievement. I mean, I'm sure I would get her to pay attention, but I mean more broadly in policy frameworks, I would need to make sure that I make the connection to learning to academic outcomes. So policy professionals might be skeptical about the value of putting money and time into socio-emotional curricula, and is that skepticism justified? And I would argue that it is actually justified. It is right for policy professionals to be skeptical. Children's emotional and behavioral problems may not be the cause of academic difficulty, right? So I made a story there that was kind of implicit that children's behavioral development and emotional development and executive function development is going to drive their learning. But perhaps children act out because they're having academic difficulty, not the other way around, right? So I've made a causal story there that I have to be able to support. 
Do we have evidence that we can change children's self-regulation? I just covered that. And so one of the solutions is to use an intervention study using randomized design or an experimental design where we randomly assign preschools or children, but in this case preschool classrooms, to receiving an intervention, um, in this case a treatment targeting children's emotional and behavioral regulation, and we compare that to other programs that have been randomly assigned to the control group. Okay, so it's just an ex explanation for why we use this experimental design in the real world, because we have to actually test whether our assumptions, our implicit assumptions, are actually right. And in doing that, I had the very amazing fortune to try that experiment out um, in Chicago with 35 cl uh, preschool classrooms in 18 Head Start sites and that's called the Chicago School Readiness Project. We were then threatened with a lawsuit by the um, Chicago Professional School of Psychology that said that Chicago School was a branded term, so we don't call it Chicago School Readiness Project anymore. We now just call it CSRP. So if you're looking for it online, you won't find Chicago School Readiness. You will only find CSRP. But CSRP was an opportunity to collaborate with this massive group of people, basically all of my research staff and data collection staff, um, who've all gone on to graduate school. Um, some really amazing funders, including McCormick Tribune and Spencer and William T. Grant. And then all of the agencies, many of which you have worked with or have partnered with or are from. So if any of you are from any of these agencies or have worked with these agencies or worked with CPS, I really cannot tell you how grateful I am to you and the, your agencies for willing to partner to make this project possible. And we had this very straightforward, in my mind, but to you, relatively complex model. <laughs> Don't you love developmental psychologists? We can't live without a million circles and boxes. And what does it say? It says that all the way on the left-hand side, children are gonna enter preschool with language and literacy skills at T1. This was during the time, remember, of No Child Left Behind, or Good Start, Grow Smart, which was George Bush's uh, pre-K version of No Child Left Behind. And we were very focused in 2004, 2005 on language and literacy. And you remember that we were really concerned that teachers would increase or improve their instruction in language and literacy. And I said, well, that's fine, possibly pretty stressful, but with kids' language skills, they're going to presumably show growth in their language skills so that by the spring, in the transition to their kindergarten year, they're going to show an improvement in their language and literacy skills. But what we left out of that picture, out of that equation, was the whole bottom half of the figure. And I'm going to walk away from the mic and just show you for a second. Okay, now you have this little freak out where I feel like Oprah, but that's okay. So <laughs> children's emotional and behavioral adjustment might actually support teacher's instruction where the l good little leader kid who's really attentive and really focused is the first one out of the blocks to get the language and all the other kids see that she's doing that and they think that's cool and so they do it too. Or you can imagine a very disruptive child who really limits teacher's ability to provide language instruction. Similarly, teachers also bring emotional and behavioral skills to the classroom. And teachers who are really veteran teachers who can run classes like a well-oiled machine can probably improve or increase the amount of instruction. But new, te new teachers or teachers who are a little bit more stressed out might actually not have those skills and might not be able to manage their children's behavioral adjustment so that over time, a children in a class, children in a class that might not have that management would actually potentially look more disruptive or have more difficult time by the end of this, the, the, their preschool year. So we tried to think about what it would like, look like if we added this bottom half. So when we talk about the integration of academic or cognitive uh, uh, instructional uh, focus and um, emotional and behavioral instructional focus, this is what we came up with, that these um, would all be very deeply related to each other. And that that might be really conditioned on um, how much family and neighborhood risk and how under-resourced or, or resourced programs might be. Does anybody have any questions about that model? while I get my mic back in. Okay, good. Okay, so our research questions were, how do children's experiences in higher quality early educational settings, such as Head Start, provide academic and socio-emotional benefits to low-income kids? 
In the short run, could we test whether children who are assigned the, the Chicago School Readiness Project intervention showed significantly imp improved or lower behavioral problems and higher self-regulation, significantly greater gains in their pre-academic skills, um, than do children in the control group, um, specifically the control assigned classrooms by the spring of their Head Start year? And do children's emotional and behavioral skills in early childhood provide additional benefit to their long-term academic success? Well, by now you'd like to know what the intervention included. What it included was teacher training, about 30 hours of teacher training using Carolyn Webster Stratton's Incredible Years um, teacher module. It's very behaviorally oriented, really about trying to help teachers um, support children by providing positive reinforcement with clear directives where teachers don't talk tons and tons like me. They do exactly the opposite. They provide clear, positive directives. And they try to catch young children at being good and reward children when they are being um, compliant, when they are being organized, when they are being directed. Um, it's, a nice, it's a very nice model. It's very, very well focused. We were worried that teachers would have a hard time doing that if the teachers themselves felt highly stressed and if the teachers themselves felt emotionally unsupported. So we added a, a component of the intervention where the coaches who were coaching teachers and using this intervention on a weekly basis in the classroom, those coaches also provided stress management and stress reduction for teachers so that teachers themselves felt supported. And then third, we had those same coaches um, provide direct clinical mental health services to the most high-risk children with the highest emotional and behavioral difficulty. Why? Because we felt that those children likely were facing traumatic experiences at home and in their neighborhoods that were actually more than what teachers could reasonably handle. The teachers had neither the clinical skill nor the time to be able to address those experiences that children were having and outside their um, classroom experiences and that those mental health consultants could actually be in a better position to provide that support to those children. So um, that basically uh, spells out what I just said. Webster Stratton's model, pairing teacher training with the coaching um, to provide for stress reduction and to increase the likelihood that the teachers would use the strategies that we taught them in the workshops, and then these one-on-one -on -one services with a mental health consultant. So where were we? We did um, a block-by-block -block survey where um, staff and I actually drove every single block in um, seven different neighborhoods to locate every single Head Start funded agency that we could. We called every single one of them up and we asked them if they'd like to be in the study. And out of that, we actually had um, slightly more than 18 sites, but actually not too many more than 18 sites, and we randomly assigned those sites to treatment and control groups. And those sites were basically selected in neighborhoods that had a lot of Head Start eligible children that did not have um, demolition of um, CHA housing because we didn't want kids in the program that were experiencing a huge amount of mobility because it would just be really tough to be able to follow them. Kids who were in neighborhoods that had above median levels of crime. And when we did that, we actually were in preschools um, in a wide range of agencies and buildings, including CPS buildings, where we got about 90% of the families um, um, agreement to participate in our study. And you can see that that's the outer ring of Chicago. Um, as all of you know, North Lawndale, um, South Lawndale, Humboldt Park, Logan Square, um, South Shore, Back of the Yards, those were the areas that had um, very high proportion of um, low-income kids who were Head Start eligible that we had a good chance of being able to um, find and follow. Um, this is just a demographic description of the kids in our sample. It just should sound a lot like children that you all are seeing in your classrooms. 66% of the children in this study were African American. The rest um, identified as his Hispanic or Latino, Latina. Uh, families on average were um, very, very below poverty level with an income to needs ratio. So they're facing uh, basically incomes of about 67% of poverty level. Most parents were working, which was really important. A lot of people ask, why did I not do a family-based intervention? And one of the reasons was that I had done previous work with low-income families in Head Start and saw that almost all the moms were working two jobs. And the idea that my trying to get families into intervention for my first intervention felt a little bit like too big a bite to bite off and chew. So I really wanted a classroom-based approach. Um, and then I wanted to point out that teachers themselves were also supporting families on relatively low incomes, and a third of those teachers were reporting feeling high levels of stress and low confidence in managing classroom behavioral difficulty. So it was not a wrong guess to guess that this was um, an area that teachers could really use support. 
and classroom quality at baseline was adequate on average. So you can see Eckers scores barely make it to five. They're just under five. And you all know about the Eckers range from one to seven, right? With substantial variability. We also use the class, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so basically, this is just to show you the two different packages. The treatment group got 30 hours of training and the mental health consultants in the classroom. And the control package actually got a teacher's assistant. Why did I give the control group a teacher's assistant one day a week? What? Did I not want them to know that they were in the control group? I wanted the control group to definitely feel like everybody got something good. And I honestly wanted to face down the skeptical question of whether it really was a socio-emotional uh, classroom management strategies and mental health consultation package that made the difference or just the extra pair of hands, right? The mental health consultant who's the coach is in the classroom about one day a week. And I was worried that if I just compared that to basic, somebody would say, well, that, there was extra staffing in that room. Why else might I have done it? I might have done it also because maybe an extra pair of hands in the room would be the solution, right? Maybe teachers with an extra hand, pair of hands in the room would be able to effectively manage kids' behavior and have more time teaching. So this was a, a horse race, if you want to put it that way, where I was going to come out winning either way. If control group looked better than the treatment group, I would learn that we needed extra staffing in the classroom and we didn't need an expensive intervention. If the treatment group came out over the control group, I would know that we really could benefit from extra support in ways that were not just about an extra pay of hands. If it came out even, I would go home having spent the government's money feeling very sad and try again next time, right? But luckily, that's not how the story played out, as you'll see. Tons and tons of data, the classroom data I collected using the class, and I have numbers of publications on that, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Today I'm really going to talk about the child level data. Specifically, we collected a lot of data on teachers' reports of internalizing and externalizing or behavior problems, a lot of data on kids' self-regulation, and then kindergarten follow-up, which I'll get to. So these are the findings that we published in 2010, and they show that we significantly reduced kids' behavior problems. Sorry, we is the improper term. My intervention staff and the teachers significantly in improved children's behavior problems by reducing them an average three points. So you can see if zero is the line where there's no difference between treatment and control, this is the difference between treatment and control that was achieved. And you can see the treatment group kids showed a reduction of behavior problems by three points, and that was a little bit smaller for boys and a little bit larger for girls, a little bit smaller for African American kids and a little bit bigger for Latino kids. But on average, you can see that the treatment effects are all in the same direction and they're pretty consistent across time. And here you can see that they don't differ by risk. So we were really pleased that that showed that basically the intervention significantly benefited all kinds of kids in the different programs. Some a little bit more, some a little bit less, but more or less all in the same direction. We next wanted to know whether children's self-regulation was, was really affected, because that's what we set out to do. And we designed an assessment where we directly assessed children's executive function by asking them to tap pencils, for example. When I set, tap my pencil two times, you tap your pencil one time. When I tap my pencil one time, I want you to tap your pencil two times. I have a hard time remembering how to deliver the instructions, right? <laughs> Three and four year olds have to actually listen to what I said, remember the rule, and inhibit the prepotent tendency to just do what I did instead of listen to what I say. It's a great task for looking at kids' executive function. And then this bottom one, we actually ask kids to hold an M&M on their tongue and not eat it for a minute and a half. <laughs> and if it makes you feel any better, the grown up had to do it too. And then the grown up would eat it first and say, ah, you win, you're awesome. And that's how we would end the assessment. We also had, at the time, the national reporting system requirement to collect all of the vocabulary, letter naming, and math skills that were part of that national battery of assessments that you all know a lot about. So we actually have some data on their cognitive outcomes as well. So what are our results? Our results are clear, significant impacts on children's executive function that um, pencil tap task and walking a balance beam, and on global assessments, independent assessors ratings of attention and impulsivity. This was really big news. This means that so kids' self-regulation 
is malleable and can be changed by having children in better managed and more emotionally positive classrooms. Because when compared to a randomly assigned control group, treatment group kids looked a lot better. This is what we found in terms of their academically oriented outcomes. On the PPVT, kids in the treatment group showed significantly improved lang language. On the letter naming, significantly improved letter naming. And on early math, significantly improved early math. So the intervention led to children performing considerably better on these on standardized cognitive outcomes. Right? Does that mean that they were learning more in the classrooms? I think that it does. It at least means that they performed better on those independent assessments. Okay. Now, is it enough? Of course not. Of course we know that we would also need to support the amount of curricular uh, intensity or l language and math teaching that's going on in the classroom. The kids are not going to show this if teachers are not also supporting children's language and, and math um, opportunities to learn in their classrooms. But assuming that those are there or that they can be boosted in a context of more positive classroom uh, management, we see clear evidence of significant gains. I'm doing well for time. Good. Okay, so what about teachers? It turns out I'm very strongly of the mind that the reason that we um, were able to achieve this kind of success with this intervention was primarily because we focused on teachers as the primary levers of change, as, as intervention or prevention science talks about it. And that means that we really thought a lot about what happens when a teacher interacts with a kid in a way that's stressful not only to the kid, but also stressful to the teacher. So we talk about that as an aversive episode, when a teacher starts to feel like she's losing control or losing um, a battle of will <laughs> with a small person who does not want to do what she's just asked him to do, like line up in the, for getting ready to go to the bathroom or the gym, or when she's really trying to get him to stop fidgeting and sit crisscross applesauce, and that child is not doing that. So we think about that aversive episode as actually heightening the teacher's own negative emotional arousal, which might actually affect the teacher's own attention, right? The biggest challenge we found with a teacher in the teacher training was teaching the teacher to not keep nattering at the child who was being um, basically behaviorally problematic or disruptive, but instead to focus her attention on the child or the children who are actually sitting crisscross applesauce and reward those children. So to ignore low-level disruptive behavior is very tough. I can say it as a parent and I can say it as a teacher of adults. It's tough. But you have to be able to do that as a teacher in order to really recruit most of the class and to have that class go with you and to then build the, the skills and the strengths of that disruptive child to align with the more behaviorally um, pulled together kids. The teacher also may make a negative attribution about herself as a teacher. So we found teachers who said about themselves, I'm just not good at this. I really love doing this, but I just don't know how to do it. I just don't feel good at it because I can't get my classroom under control. And that negative attribution actually increases her sense of, of emotional distress the next time she gets in a head-to-head -head conflict with that child. So we really thought about trying to disrupt that cycle so that the teacher could respond in a way that does not lead to a child escalating and does not lead to a teacher burning out. That was our goal. And we found that um, it wasn't actually our goal, rather, it was what we learned from teachers in the process of trying to implement this intervention. And in the process, we also realized that there were additional classroom stressors and personal and workplace stressors that played into this particular model that would lead to teachers becoming either more burnt out or more engaged. The second thing that we tried to do is to detect whether these findings are robust across multiple interventions. I was very fortunate in working with a great team and a great set of sites. Some sites were really struggling. One site had a health, um, uh, health finding um, and had to be closed for seven weeks, and the entire site had to move to Altgeld Gardens. All the kids, all the teachers, and our, our, our coach all had to get on a bu bus and go to a remote site. Like There were some sites that were really struggling, but that said, we had a remarkable amount of participation. So you might say, well, Sabelle, that was just a function of your good luck that time. How do we know we should build policy on your one experiment? I partnered with my friend Pam and colleague Pamela Morris at MDRC. She's now at NYU. And we ran this study four more times, or three more times. You can see we ran it as a pilot in Newark with 17 sites. And I loved that she thought that her pilot, her 17 sites, which was the same as my huge study, she called that her pilot. I was like, wait a minute. 
because the next thing she did was she ran it with 51 sites, and then she came back to Chicago and ran it again with 20 sites. So all in all, we've now run this study with 100 sites, and we feel pretty confident that our results, while they differ in some respects, they show consistently that we can consistently show improvements in classroom quality in terms of climate, and imp consistently show improvements in kids' task orientation and behavioral self-control. So in terms of how this model works, it shows nice ability to be replicated across multiple sites and in multiple times um, in multiple cohorts. Oh, so sorry, that's terrible. Um, I would show you these coefficients, but they look horrible. And it just shows improvement in children's task engagement and improvement in, in uh, overall students' engagement, suggesting that children have increased opportunities for learning, and I apologize for that. So what are the take-home messages from these intervention findings? First, it supports the model for the ways that self-regulation is malleable and can be shaped by the environment. And second, it suggests that when children's self-regulation is targeted at the level of the classroom context, children demonstrate substantial emotional and behavioral and academic gains. A real vindication of my uh, mentor Ed Ziegler's emphasis on the whole child. But I think I would actually really disagree with Dr. Cheatham in this idea of silver bullets. And that's because Ziegler taught me very early on that there is no silver bullet in the sense that you can't give children one intervention at one point in their development and hope that somehow they're going to carry the benefits of it like little suitcases to the next spot and the next spot and the next spot along the long trajectory that they have to travel. An optimistic hypothesis is that children will be better able to capitalize on future opportunities for learning. And I am enough of an optimist that I wish that to always be true. But a less optimistic hypothesis is the gains will only be sustained as long as children continue to have access to high quality classroom practices. And now I'm going to show you for the next couple of minutes, yes, in the next couple of minutes, why I think so strongly that this second point is really important to communicate. So specifically, what happens when children go to elementary school? What represents a fair expectation of long-term impact of an intervention? My intervention, or Head Start, or Perry Preschool, or any intervention? What is a fair expectation for an intervention? Specifically, what are children facing besides changes in preschool quality? Well, with um, amazing, amazing um, support from research um, staff and um, from Chicago Public Schools staff, we've been able to follow families with their consent through their transitions to elementary school. And kids went from 18 preschools to over 200 elementary schools in the Chicago area. So they've gone, they've gone literally all over the city, which gives us this amazing opportunity to look at how children fare when they move to different schools of higher versus lower quality. So specifically, they've got experimental change in preschool, but they're still facing high levels of poverty and instability in their homes. They go to kindergarten with lots of different ways of thinking about school quality in kindergarten. And then they go to third grade with lots of ways to think about school quality. And the way that we think of this empirically from a scientific perspective is that children are exposed to a second treatment, a second intervention called the real world of higher versus lower quality education. And I don't have the opportunity to randomize or randomly assign children to those new worlds. They sort themselves into those new worlds. Their parents sort them into those new worlds. School systems sort them into those worlds. So I can only model and map how they make that transition. Sorry, I'm waving, but a very dear colleague just walked in the door. And similarly, they're facing not only this new world, this second treatment of the real world, their families continue to either struggle with a high level of poverty or to move out of poverty. So we have to model, at the same time that we model where the kids are going in school, we have to model where the parents are going in terms of their life course trajectories and their life outcomes. So what did we find when we tried to follow children um, into kindergarten? We just got this paper accepted into, into press in a, a public policy journal. What we first found is that overall the effects of CSRP on self-reg and school readiness are a big fat zero, null. So when we looked at children in kindergarten, we asked their teachers, we found that there was no lasting impact of my intervention, or rather my team's intervention. How heartbreaking. We worked so incredibly hard and we found big zero. But what we did find when we looked more carefully was that we split schools on a very, very rough and kind of ugly measure of school quality. Just does the school have kids who are above uh, the median in terms of the percentage of kids meeting or exceeding state standards on the ISAT. 
So you know that the schools vary tremendously in their quality. And we just made a line and we said some schools that fall above the line are going to call, be called high quality and schools that fall below the line are going to be called low quality. And when we compare kids to their control group counterparts matching in a very precise, statistically cool way um, for um, ways in which kids sorted into those schools, we find that kids who went to high quality schools actually continued to show decreases in their internalizing and externalizing behavior disorder, behavior problems. They continue to look really good. In fact, they looked even better than their control group counterparts. But kids who went into low quality schools actually look worse than their control group counterparts. Okay? So those kids had benefit of intervention and then they got sorted back into very, very chaotic and large kindergarten classrooms and those kids actually didn't look better than kids in the control group. They actually looked worse. Now it's not statistically significant. You can see the 2.66 doesn't have a star next to it. But it means that actually having a little bit of intervention and then being tossed back into a big, scary classroom was not necessarily a good thing. And that's why we get zero, because if you think about all the positive stuff that's happening for these kids and the somewhat, somewhat seriously negative stuff that's happening to these kids, that would average to zero. Okay, so it taught me that the pre-K to K alignment is not just a really nice rhetorical or theoretical perspective. That's a real nuts and bolts, rubber meets the road issue where kids are needing that level of continuity because they're not going to benefit from early investment unless we make that commitment real to them over time. Okay, so with that, we can now say, well, the effects of CSRP for the entire sample are null, but for the group that manages to make their way into better quality schools, they're actually continuing to be positive. So where are we going now? Through innovative um, partnership with Chicago Public Schools, we've been able to follow 80% of our kids, which is just amazing. Many studies are not able to follow that higher percentage of their kids. And I think that's largely because um, the community of practitioners and administrators is really interested to see how these kids are faring, as well as are their families um, really like being in the study and um, th I think experience it as a positive thing. Some children are emerging with very strong profiles of academic success and civic engagement. We ask kids um, whether they go to um, vote with their parents. We ask kids whether they're engaged in a church or um, community um, social service activity or community service activity. We ask kids um, all kinds of questions about the strengths of their participation in their neighborhoods. Uh, we also ask kids um, whether they have um, kissed anybody, whether they've held hands with anybody. We're getting a lot of data on early um, pre-adolescent um, uh, risk type act, um, behavioral um, sort of frameworks to think about these kids' life course trajectories, as well as getting a huge amount of data on their academic performance um, using administrative data, and of course, all with their parents' consent. And now, with their consent, their assent, because they're 12, and you ask 12-year-olds very carefully if they want to do stuff. Um, and we're very much paying attention to the role of socio-emotional curricula in elementary school, and we are really paying attention to positive school climate versus negative school climate as rated by their older peers. So you know that um, because of um, the a continued interesting activity of Kaisel and Roger Weisberg here at um, Chicago, there's this way in which middle school children rate the quality of their school experience, and we're able to use that um, student uh, survey to actually rate schools on the basis of what older uh, middle school kids think about schools and that's turning out to be a very valuable source of information about school quality. And we're also looking at the role of um, children's exposure to community violence by linking the data that we have to um, crime data in the city to see what happens for children who are in neighborhoods where their schools or their homes are experiencing a high number of homicides. Um, what we find is that, and what we think would be logical, is that a high quality preschool alone is not likely to be a strong predictor of children's outcomes given that huge, huge wealth of other um, things that are going on in children's lives. So what can we think about? We think a lot about how children enter much larger ecologies in kindergarten through third. How can we think about schools as buffers to experiences of stress at home? Or how can we think of schools as magnifiers of stress at home? We find that um, for some children, learning is supported in schools that are emotionally less positive. So using the student connection surveys, we found that in 2009, for example, 17% of middle schoolers reported that they did not feel physically safe in their schools. They did not feel emotionally safe. They reported being teased, bullied, 
bullied or ha harassed, and they wanted to stay home or wanted to change schools. So for some kids, they're making their way into awesome, great schools. And for other kids, they're making their way into schools that are really, really emotionally difficult places. And how that um, may have effects on kids' self-regulation is what we're particularly interested in. Um, so our new work is specifically looking at school climate and children's self-regulation. Um, I'm not going to take the time to read the bulk of these two, next two slides, except to say that school climate is defined as the personality or character of school life. And um, we also think about not just kids in classrooms, um, not just kids in schools, but also kids in classrooms, the quality of relationship that teachers have with kids is um, equally important and may actually buffer kids from um, the toughness of the school or the benefits or the strengths of the school. And I'm going to just show you one example of that. So in many ways, we thought about teacher-student relationships and student academic outcomes, and we thought a lot about how teacher-child uh, relationship is predictive of academic achievement, and that's been much truer for older kids, and you know, we wanted to see if it was true for younger kids. And here, this is a presentation that we're about to make um, at SRCD um, at the end of this week. We find that kids um, who are in schools where their older peers report that the school is not supportive, basically, that adults don't really care about kids in my school. We find that those kids basically are, are, gain, are, are, are doing reasonably well in math, but not great in math, when teacher support is low. But when teacher support is high and the school is quality is high, we see kids learning a lot more math. Okay, so it's just to take from this figure that kids learn are learning the most in classrooms and in schools that are emotionally supportive, both at the classroom and at the school level. Okay, so it's taking a combination of both the school climate and the teacher-child relationship to make that clear, um, higher uh, point in learning. Okay. So lastly, I just want to conclude where um, the evidence for us suggests that there really is clear um, data to, or finding to, to suggest uh, that preschool quality makes a significant difference in getting a young child emotionally and academically ready for school. And we find that investing in executive function and self-regulation clearly leads to not only better behavioral outcomes, but also to short-term academic gains. So the big question is, is it worth it to put the time and effort into a pre-K intervention if those gains are lost the following year? That's a fair policy question to ask. And our answer is that investment needs to be sustained across that transition from pre-K to third, or at least from pre-K to first, if you're going to roll it out and you have to think about it. But we really would like to see it all the way through third. There's, if it's going to disappear and dissipate between pre-K and K, it's probably going to dissipate later. So if you take your foot off the gas pedal, the car will, in fact, slow down, right? It's just a reality. That's, we cannot expect kids to somehow carry the load on their own in, in, in settings that we don't continue, continue to provide support and investment in. Investments in socio-emotional learning in K to third have recently yielded impressive results for academic gains. So when you make that effort, when you keep your foot on the gas pedal, uh, work by my colleagues Josh Brown and Stephanie Jones and Larry Aber, find really nice results that uh, socio-emotional curricula in integrated into kids' reading, um, for example, in um, uh, third grade through sixth grade leads to not only better behavioral outcomes but better reading outcomes for the most behaviorally disruptive dropout high risk kids in the sample. So, and it leads to higher reading gains for the whole classroom, but particularly for those kids at highest risk. What's important is that those gains aren't realized until the second year of the intervention. The first year, everybody's just trying to get on board. The second year is where they see that payoff. Investments in quality can be made in academic domains at pre-K through third grade, but not at the expense of emotional climate and socio-emotional development. So some people have asked me, Sabelle, would you say that you should put money in reading or in executive function? And I say, nice try. I'm not going to fall for it. <laughs> you can put it in emotional and, and, and so socio-emotional development, and I believe that you'll get socio-emotional and some learning gains. But you have to have an academically oriented or cognitively oriented, learning oriented curriculum at least somewhere in place to have that learning happen. Similarly, you can put a cognitively oriented or learning oriented or academically oriented curriculum at place, but not at the expense of maintaining or increasing a positive emotional climate in the classroom. 
So I've seen curricula that have a very strong, very clear and very impressive emphasis on math and on reading, but I have seen them implemented in ways where the classroom climate is forsaken. And I don't think that's a good idea because I think that that leads to a high level of pressure experienced both by children and by teachers that may lead to short-term gains in the next test-taking session, but not actual learning gains, which is what we're going for. So with that, I really want to thank everyone for their time and attention. I hope I've left enough time for questions and for comments. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, continuing the discussion. If anybody would like more um, resources or information, um, if you Google my name and um, CSRP, you'll see a picture of a younger, more blonde me against a hedge uh, at the NYU website with all of my um, papers, and you just click on the little word view and the paper will pop up. So that we've tried to make those empirical papers available online so that everybody can um, get a second read. <laughs>